Cool. Hope my voice isn't too scratchy and uh, that I am the appropriate level of excited for nine in the morning. Yeah. I kind of going for cognitive dissonance here with uh, the amazing feats of the abstract syntax tree. Hopefully you're not walking away with me, but you know, to each their own. So brief introduction. I'm James, start automating. I've been scripting for about 16 years and counting. I helped build the PowerShell language in Microsoft, specifically V2 and V3, which basically is the PowerShell you all know and love. Um, a lot of the major features came in then. I also found, did one of the first PowerShell consultancies when I left Microsoft in 2010. And I've made a life's work out of growing the language. And I really, really enjoy continuing to take PowerShell to new heights and places spaces and that's kind of what we're going to cover a lot today. PowerShell is built to grow in so many ways. Um, there are just so many features inside of PowerShell that give you something to build on top of that don't exist in other languages or aren't well surfaced in other languages. It has really really strong foundations. And you might know of a few of them like say the type subsystem or the formatting system or the object pipeline. We all know and love that one, right? But not a lot of people know about this abstract syntax tree. And it is the bedrock of expanding PowerShell drastically. And that's really the subject of today's talk. So let's talk about syntax abstractly. Every language is parsed into an abstract, abstract syntax tree. Most languages keep this to themselves. Like it's just a part of how you turn whatever was text into actual code. You go through, you lexically group it, and then you parse it, and then you turn it into an abstract syntax tree, and you walk that tree. Every language does it. Most languages keep this as a compiler detail or an interpreter detail. You have no exposure to the AST. PowerShell's AST is public. It's seriously, it's system management automation language AST. That's the base type they're all based off of. The AST is also available on any script block, any script block. If it is a valid script block, it will have an AST. Thus, any script block can be searched and transformed. I did want to start off with some of the examples about search, but I realized it would talk a little bit more about the module that's going to be the bulk of it. So we're going to go a lot heavier on transform in this particular talk. But before we get there, let's talk about what makes legal PowerShell. And this is actually a really good topic because most people don't really stop to interrogate it that much. What is legal in PowerShell? Well, much more than you'd think. Attributes don't need to be real. You guys all know that? Like It's still valid PowerShell even if the attribute doesn't exist. It won't prove you wrong until it runs, at least unless it's on a class. Classes are a little clinically annoying like that. Commands don't need to exist either. Like I can be parsing an AST and I can get a name of a command and all the arguments to a command without having resolved the command, without there actually being a command. Commands can also be named almost anything you imagine. There are a very small number of characters that you can't use to start them if you were to say function x, y, or z, but even those you can get around. You can actually directly assign to the function drive any command name you can possibly imagine. And you can invoke it later, too. Like, you can give a multi-word command that, that's possible. It's just not something most people realize. So PowerShell syntax is a far more open oyster than almost any other language. The language that kind of ends up being closest to in this respect is JavaScript, actually, because JavaScript also has a deceptively open syntax once you kind of get to know it. 
So what happens when we start to bend the rules of PowerShell? Well, let's see. Since PowerShell syntax is more open than expected, we can bend a lot of rules. And that's a big takeaway from that last slide. We can add pseudo attributes to configure functions and parameters. Because an attribute doesn't need to exist yet, I can take that syntax space and I can use it to run stuff. In fact, in addition to the things that I'm going to show you today, one of the coolest things you can do is actually use that as a way to basically pre-run any command that exists as an alternative way to provide commands and parameters, but instead of at runtime, at build time. We can also make commands that are much more flexible than verb noun pairs. A great example of this is multiple instances of the same argument. Valid AST, invalid to execute. So that's something that one could discover and fix. We can tweak the syntax to be a lot more simple and understandable. And that's where we kind of get to, I think, a little bit of bad slide layout, because I forgot to delete a few bullet points, and TypeScript. TypeScript is a language that I have been building on top of PowerShell for the better part of the last year. It is transpiled into PowerShell. TypeScript files are star.ps1, or psps1, or psps1. And this is basically as a hint that I'm going to have something PowerShell-like, and I'm going to be building PowerShell. This is basically true for any number of file types. We're going to get back to that at the end. But I can have, say, psmd, or ps.txt, or ps.json, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. But PSPSN, or PSPS1s are where we're going to kind of look at today and are the way that you define a TypeScript file and how it's built into a PS1. And all it'll do is it'll transpile that, strip off the PS or PS, leave you with whatever.ps1. Okay? It transpiles to PowerShell. What comes out of TypeScript is PowerShell should be runnable on any box, should not have any dependency on TypeScript. And its goal is to make scripting more programmable and programming more scriptable. I mean, we already kind of operate in this kind of nice luminal devops -y space in PowerShell, but we're not as good of a programming language as we can be, and the scripting techniques that we can bring to bear on other languages aren't really done so cohesively or elegantly. Like, a lot of people program in PowerShell, and a lot of people meta-program in PowerShell, but they don't do it consistently. And that means that we don't get a flourishing ecosystem here. It also opens up the syntax of PowerShell very significantly. Uh, at a high level of how it works, because we're not going to get too far into the nitty-gritty today, it literally goes through the whole abstract, abstract syntax tree. I'm really going to hate saying that all the time, so I'm just going to start to say AST goes through the whole AST, top to bottom, and it figures out for everything, hey, is there anything that wants to transpile this? OK, go ahead, have a try. If you return back script block, I'll replace what was there. If you don't return anything, you didn't need to return anything, and I'll move on. OK, if you return an empty script block, you disappear. Also, it lets us template 45 other languages with PowerShell and TypeScript and count them. Like I said, there's a lot of ps.md, ps.txt, ps.json, ps.html, etc. files being created. It's fun. Template files take the format star.ps or star.ps1 language. Many extensions are supported. Today we're going to do a brief tour of some of the amazing feats PipeScript can give us. Starting off with the ABCs. And I'm a little kitschy like this. I, I'm sorry, I get to make up fun terminology from time to time. And given what you're about to see and what I just described about attributes, I hope this makes sense. You are composing your script with attributes. They just don't happen to be real attributes, although that's a little bit of magic TBD. I mean, theoretically, one could actually make this work off of real attributes, too, and just have a special type of attribute. Anyway, attribute-based composition. 
That's our ABCs of TypeScript. By declaring a transpiler for a pseudo attribute, we can shorten the code and functions. Don't get too stuck on this for a second. Well, I'll go to a demo soon, I promise. Starting very simple, there's include. Who writes modules that are basically just go grab all the files in this directory and dot source them? How would you like to never write those five lines of script again? Me too. So that's basically the module file I have for each. Actually, that's a typo that I accidentally copied and pasted into a demo for a second. That should be star dash star dot ps1. So let me fix that real quick, just because neuroses. There. Back. That one liner makes up most PSM ones. There's also inherit. I'm trying to pick my favorites here because there are a lot of these already. And inherit, well, allows you to inherit a command. Like that would build a command that inherits get process, has all the same parameters as get process, looks and quacks like get process. And it'll inherit it dynamically. So when I have actually fixed parameters, it'll go map dynamic parameters for you. And I'll inherit it abstractly, meaning it won't run it. It'll just let you use that metadata for whatever you'd like. And you can do this to any command. I talked about UGIT a couple days ago. You can do this to applications, too. What I did with UGIT, all you need to do is inherit blah command type equals application. That's it. And you have intercepted an app, and you can do whatever you'd like with it. Another one is that we have extended parameter attribution. The same trick can work on parameters, too, and do a bunch of special things. And we're going to go demos after this one just to kind of show you it in action. And I've covered my favorites to lead into it. So some of my favorites are validate types. Everybody knows that you can make anything a PS object, right? And everybody knows you can have a validate script attribute, right? So all validate types really does is writes a fancy validate script that says you have to be this type or that type or that type or that type. And now I can have a parameter, one parameter, be X number of types and work perfectly with the object pipeline. Think about how many times you've written three parameters because you want three different types to work. You can get away from that. There's also just convenient ones. I do not ever want to type value from pipeline by property name again in my life. I love it. I really do. It's one of the best features of the object pipeline in PowerShell, but it's so much typing. It's so typo prone. VFP and VBN. Sorry, I have another typo there. Sorry. Typos in my slides. I even remember resume here. Thank you. That kind of day. There's also validate script block. And I'm not going to demonstrate that much of this one. This is go look at it, go see how it works, go see how many things it can do. But it can do stuff like I will accept a script block that will have no loops. I will accept a script block that will run no commands. I will accept a script block that will run these three commands. I will accept a script block that will only use these three variables, so on and so forth. You can actually get as advanced as you want, and you can say I'm validating a script block with a custom condition on the AST. So you can make as safe script block input as you'd like. Huge, huge benefit there. And now let's go to demo mode, because I think I have a duplicated slide, and I promised. Unfortunately, only slightly unfortunately, hold on. Unfortunately, I'm having trouble typing over to VS Code, and we've got some monitor problems. There we go. Unfortunately, part two, I discovered a bug in my demo script right before this, and unfortunately, part three, where's my mouse? Thank you. OK. So let's go ahead and import the latest version of the module. And real fingers crossed here. I tweaked my demos at home, released a new version of PipeScript this morning. 
Just did it get pulled? Okay. Demo gods be kind. Now I really jinxed myself. I'm actually move into my demos directory. And on this one, I don't actually have, I have another one for search pipe script, but I do not have what this produced. Okay, so we already covered include. There's a few different ways you can transpile whatever code. One of them is you can use the function use pipe script directly. There are also every single transpiler that exists is alias to use function. And yes, I can. And I can also make this a little bit more even. How is it for everybody in the back now? Oh, that might be too much. Good? Okay, too much we go for. Uh, let's see, I can collapse that. that that's easier. There we go. Yeah. That go away too? No. I, no wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm going back to my monitor for a second. I gotta fix that. <laughs> Control W, you said. Thank you. I do love VS Code, but I also sometimes hate VS Code. Anyway, let's uh, not mess with it anymore before it gets mad at me. So, you can use PipeScript. You can also dot transpile, because one of the things PipeScript does is extends a lot of types in PowerShell, including script block. And you can also pipe it directly to the core transpiler. This is an alias to use PipeScript. You can run any transpiler this way. Sort of, because some of them do require complicated AST types. They're not necessarily going to be the easiest thing to run in Act directly in all cases. So three different ways to do the same thing, but all of them are just taking that one line of include, saying, oh, you're not a real attribute. I know what to do with you. I know how to replace that. We can go look at how it works in a second if you'd like, but let's keep going through this demo and make ourselves a mini module. So we're putting that in PipeScript demo.psps1. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and build that using export PypeScript. And by the way, I'm a little cheeky with a lot of these. Almost every major command uh, with the PypeScript noun is also alias to script block. So export script block would also be valid here. Even though not all cases is it exporting a script block. There's a lot of other cases like new PypeScript, join PypeScript, update PypeScript, where this makes a lot of sense because they're just providing a general purpose tool for you to manipulate script blocks. Okay? So we've got our basic PSM1. And if I go look at that file, that has what we had in our include. Even lets me exclude some files, yay for that. Okay. Then I'm going to declare the send event function. I have a little bugbear or two with the event subsystem. Um, one of them is that new event does not support value from pipeline. The other one is that I don't think it should output by default. So let's just fix these two. Here's VBN for value by name. So we're going to allow our source identifier or alias event name to be passed from the pipeline by property name. There's VFP, value from pipeline for our message data, and then a value by name for our pass through. Then in process, we just send an event. And then if we pass through, return it. That's it. We're done. So I'm going to go write that to send event.psps1. And I think this is about the right time to mention that everything that you do in PypeScript can run in its own GitHub action. So for most of my modules at this point, I'm just referencing the GitHub action for PypeScript and building away. In fact, sometimes I call it one of the first CICD native languages because it is really happy to build in the cloud. Okay, so now we've got our send event function. Almost, but why stop at one? 
you know, we already talked about how powerful, and here it is, let's just see it a little bit in action. Another thing I hate about the event subsystem is you get back events in the wrong order. When you get event, you get the first event ever first, not the most recent event. This is wrong. Just, I don't know why, I'm, I'm going to name it, I don't know why Lee Holmes did that that way. <laughs> I don't, I do know that um, I never really won an argument with Lee Holmes. So, uh, going on, away from pettiness, I suppose. This receive is an abstract inheritance. We're not going to call get event directly or let it call it for us. We're going to do something with it. So we actually want to inherit from this, take all of its command or parameters. Actually, this was a little vestigial. I started to add a first parameter. Sorry about that. So our code gets even simpler. We call our base command, which is this magic variable you get when you inherit. Because you're inheriting from something, right? You wouldn't want to have to always remember what to type. You'd want that to be automatic. So we're inheriting from that base command. We run the base command with the round parameters, and we just reverse the array. Real easy fix. So we're going to set that into receive event. PSPS1. Okay. And now that we've got both of those there, let's export again, but with its alias just because I have this muscle memory and I like PowerShell 7 and on verbs. And I prefer to think of this as build pipe script more than export pipe script. That was its original name. People were like, I wanted to use on 5.1, fine. But you're building. So BPS, build pipe script. Uh, three files to build. One, there's our demo, PSM1. Also, this laptop may be slow. There's receive event. As you see, they're a little bit longer than what I typed in. And there's send event. So let's take a quick look at each. There's our original file and our receive event PS1. Let's actually go open it in code because otherwise scrolling is going to kill me. Or just code is going to kill me. So we've inherited for receive event. We have all their built-in uh, commands and parameters. We're using the dynamic parameter block to map what we're actually talking to. We do also set uh, the underlying command. We cache it so that we're not kind of getting it all the time. And we run and we're done. So there's receive. Got to be a little bit longer. And if I go look at send, and we're going to really have to start flying after this demo. We've got our source identifier, our message data, our pass through, lots more code, and we're done. Okay, so going back to my demo for a second, let's import our module, and there we go. Everybody following along so far? Hopefully. So I wrote a module that was a lot bigger out of a lot less code. And again, this is the tip of a very big iceberg. So now, back to the iceberg. Accidental slide or, or duplication. Let's talk about syntax improvements because there's a bunch of these too. There's a lot of little ones, like uh, dotting will let you quickly describe objects. You can say dot property equals foo, or dot property equals bar, one after another after another to create an object. This is something that drives non-power shell people absolutely bonkers when they first enter the R ecosystem. Every other language on the face of the planet, it seems, uses double equals for equality comparison, except us. And I'm sure we've all seen a colleague rant, rave, drive themselves nuts, trying to find out why their double equals doesn't work. Well, it works in PypeScript. 
It's actually one of the simplest transpilers to write, because literally all I have to do is look, well, OK, on an assignment statement, sure, but the thing you're assigning is a command that starts with equals? OK, you're double equals. I got it. I just rewrite that as left dash EQ right. Done. Conditional keywords shorten a lot of syntax. This is a pretty new one. This is also something that, say, JavaScript has. Uh, they'll have basically a lighter form of their continues and breaks and small conditionals. So I can say break if true. I can also do this with a label. I can say break foo if true. I can return if true. I can throw if true. I can continue if true. I can also continue complex if statement with other thing that I do before true. So you want to save a few lines of code there? You can get it. Big new one is namespaced commands. And this is actually really simple to understand. Blah function name is blah is the namespace, name is the name of the function. You will get a command called blah.name. And the advantage of having something like this is that you can look for all commands that match that naming pattern very fast. So we can start basically saying, here is a whole special category of commands, not just ones in my module, but in any module that should work consistently. So we're moving way beyond verb noun pairing here. There's also support for protocols. This is one of my favorite bits of PowerShell legalese, but did you know like getlogger.com? That, that's a PowerShell command. Like it, that's valid PowerShell syntax. And I'm not gonna go for it there, but I will go back to my code window for a second and show, because one of the crazier things that we do is we actually look for command not found once you import PipeScript, import PipeScript. And when we don't find the command, we'll try to double check if there's a transpiler. So even though there is not a get command, get logger, doesn't exist yet. How's that for dark arts of PowerShell? But it gets way better because it's not just HTTP. I say protocols. It actually looks, do I have colon slash slash? Okay, I could be a protocol. Then it looks for a specific type of transpiler that could handle a protocol. It says, hey, do I have something for HTTP? Great. Cool. Do I have something for UDP? Cool. So I can send UDP 127001. There's no place like home. Also, you all should get that joke. <laughs> Let's talk keywords and other commands. PipeScript includes a lot of keywords to try to simplify things. Some of them are uh, long requested language features, like asserts. You can assert in PypeScript. And I think it actually does it right. The way asserts work is you will only actually act, generate code if you're in a debug build, if you invoke PypeScript debug or export PypeScript debug. At that point, I know you want to debug. I can change the code you generate. So you can have a debug build of your PowerShell with asserts. Just let that all soak in. Because we've been operating in this world where like, we're half a programming language for a decade and a half. Now we have basically a compiler. Again, tip of a very big iceberg. New. And this does more things than the built-in new does. It'll look for a colon colon create. It'll look for a colon colon parse. So I can finally do new script block text. Tell me that hasn't been driving you all a little bit nuts for years. There's requires, like requires latest PypeScript. Everybody understand what that does? Cool. Of course, the most interesting of them all is all. 
And that's because commands can be sentences. Almost any written sentence is valid PowerShell. I'm not joking. The exception to the rule is starting with a keyword and a couple of things related to parentheses and punctuation choices. For the most part, if you can type it or think it, it could be a PowerShell command. This is insanely exciting because this can answer a lot of problems, not just in our world, but in all of computing. One of the big problems in the computing world right now is what's called the chain of thought problem. AI is going to make a decision, and it isn't going to need to justify that decision. Right now, because those learning models are so opaque to people and so machine-oriented, there's no way to make that explainable. Well, if we can make AI at least turn some of their logic into a PowerShell statement, then we can have their chain of thought. Of course, we can do a lot cooler things with that way before that. We don't even need an AI to guess at some of these things. We can use an alternative parser to allow TypeScript to be written as a natural language. It's actually all about 300 lines. Literally all it does is it goes through, looks for a bare word or a double dash or a slash or a single dash as a signal for a parameter name, then looks for values just like normal PowerShell. So that means that if you had a switch parameter, you just don't need the dash anymore. It also means that basically any user convention for parameter passing is now supportable. They're all the same to TypeScript at this point. Dash, slash, double dash, no dash. I don't care. You define the parameter. It's enough for me to figure out if I can parse it. Thus, this beautiful insanity is, in fact, valid PowerShell. All functions that quack are ducks. OK, let's break this down. All is basically an iterator. You know, it's essentially a for each object. Well, I correct myself. For each object is far too slow. It is a for each statement. Yeah, no good mad already. Functions is a switch parameter. There are a fair number of switch parameters. There's scripts, variables. Uh, there are basically switch parameters for each command type. Um, you can also pass it normal input objects, like all dollar v. You can also assume this is a ps type name. But functions, that's a well-known, got it, I understand. I know I can get all the functions. That quack. Well, that is one of the many aliases to where. At least I think it might be where is the alias to that. It doesn't really matter because you can have lots of aliases in PowerShell. And in TypeScript, sentence parsing, you can have multi-word aliases. So it could just, or it could be all functions that quack all functions that are quacking, all functions that is quack, even though that's not exactly as correct. But you see where we're going here. You can make a very flexible, actually parsable statement of this. So that quack, we got what that does. What's quack do? Well, if you're a single value, I think you could mean a few possible things. I'm making educated guesses here. I'm asking, do you have a quack, a member named quack? Like, do you have a method or a property named quack? Well, I guess you're a duck. OK, do you have a parameter named quack? Well, I guess you're a duck. And let's talk about our ducks for a second. Everybody know about PS type names? We got like one nod. So I'm going to explain this. One of the craziest things about PowerShell's extended type system is that you can give any object any type name you want and you can start extending that type that doesn't really exist. So when I say all functions that quack are ducks, I say iterate over all functions, see who has a quack member or parameter, and give them the PS type name ducks. Everybody with me so far, at least as far as we can get on that craziness. Because we're now going to, you know, check this. So we're going to make a function mallard. Actually, I have this in the you know, all's example, so I'm just going to go for that. 
because I don't like tempting that much freight. So I'm going to go up here and we can take a look at the transpiler for it if you'd like. Keywords. Oh, no. Let's do our fun example and then we can open it up. This is also valid. I like a good cheeky example. Who doesn't like a good cheeky example? But yeah, here, we're going to make our mallard function. Okay. Cool, we got a mallard function. And we're going to look at its type name in the very PowerShell object pipeline happy way. Yep. Again, sometimes I really don't love VS Code. Right now, that's a function info. Okay. There are a variety of ways that I could write this. In this case, I'm doing it a very direct way. I am transpiling that script block, which will return a new script block, and I'm dotting it. I could also write this as invoke pipe script. It would probably have some scoping issues at that point, so I'm not going to particularly try. Uh, I could use import pipe script. That would have less scoping issues. But let's go for it. All functions that quack are docs. Transpile and dot it. Okay, there's a malware. And holy duck, right? So are we all effectively mind blown? What and where are we at time wise? 36, oh, okay, we've got a little bit of runway left. We've got one slide left. And we can open things up to, I would hope some people have questions. All right, let's go back to the slide deck and finish it up. And we're gonna finish it up with talking about templating and of course, the obligatory, I forgot to add my animations to one slide. Sorry, I had a lot of slide work to do last night and I did not have a lot of slide review time. TypeScript can be used to template 45 other languages and counting. Usually it'll take the form of a block comment that has brackets immediately surrounding it. For example, in JavaScript, you can embed TypeScript with slash star curly brace, curly brace star slash. Embedded code can take parameters. And you can have multiple ones of these in a file. It'll just figure out all the parameters for you. Each language also can choose a for each object to customize how results are included. Uh, PSMDs are probably the most helpful so far, and it's also been really handy when mixing and matching HTML and PowerShell. Um, the for each object part is especially powerful because it allows us to have basically language specific embedding, right? Like, I haven't gone there yet, but if you wanted to tweak the C-sharp transpiler so that if you returned a script block, you would embed the bit of C-sharp to run the bit of PowerShell inside of C-sharp. Well, you could, you could live that inception dream. <laughs> uh, it's very cool. In fact, we're gonna go double check one bit of the count here, because I think it's actually a little bit more than 45 now. And we're gonna go look at our readme. PS1MD, which honestly, I, I probably could give this a lot more love. If anybody is really documentation happy and wants to work with me, I'd deeply appreciate any help. Here's one fun example of the thing, because this is valid. If you like PipeScript, go star it with PipeScript. So let's check how many languages. Let's see where we have it. That looks like I have that in another file. So let's go to supported languages MD. Oh, it has this nice table for me. No, I didn't want to show you the actual Markdown file. I wanted to show you how it was built. So I think that's going to be in, yeah. <coughs> supported languages.help.ps. 
cut text. So this is literally, hey, you're returning a custom object. It has a table in it. There we go. You got a markdown table. Getting all the transpilers that are working against command info. Those are the ones for templates. Figuring out what language they have. Figuring out what their synopsis and pattern is. And now I can actually have this nice previewable, well, sorry, can't remember the right key combination for that right now. So here we go on that. Control shift B, there we are. Cable of all the languages. And unfortunately, it doesn't look like it has my little counter portion. So let's go the old fashioned PowerShell way right now. Or we can just change it so it does. Let's do that. That'd be more fun. So maybe if I can get to a terminal. So let's go back to our ENUS supported languages. Help.ps.txt. And uh, you know what? Just in the interest of time, because I'd like questions rather than finish this demo, I'm just going to go pipe this to, you know, measure object. And we'll just see it that way. 48 languages now. And again, and counting. I try to actually add one roughly every release because they're easy at this point. It's just, okay, figure out your multi-line comment format. If you're C-style comments, I basically have a freebie because I've got a lot of those already. But, you know, figure out the comment format, figure out the extension format, we're done. I guess I didn't show yet one other thing that I can do that's kind of crazy on this front. I can use templates interactively. So I can say A, JS, template, blah. And not that this is that fancy or even templating that much, but A. And we're going to go ahead and save A. Let's, let's actually start to make this a little bit interactive. So param message. Uh, I got to do single quotes so it doesn't, you know, Get rid of that. Star slash. And that. And output my message. Okay. Oh. Thanks. I see that now. Unfortunately, that also means it's not in my command history. There we go. So, A, if I evaluate it, I'm going to get nothing because we don't have a message yet. Well, I guess I'm gonna get null. Hi. So is, is this all sort of kind of starting to click? I mean, I'm not saying the whole iceberg is understood because I'm going to kind of actually frighten myself in a second. I'm gonna do something that I haven't yet today. And that is, or actually haven't period. Uh, I know those who attended my you get talk know that I kind of built this whole thing to figure out what my git activity looks like or let you log your git, git logger. So we're going to go to git logger for a second and I'm going to see just how terribly low little life I have by going to the show git logger endpoint up oh, and you know what? I might also let this one go. Oh, it was your website stuff, Matt. Sorry. I'm going right to the function, not to the actual app. There. So let's go over there. It's going to ask me to give it a repo after Jira Functions has their nice cold boot. And we're going to go ahead and see just how horribly much time I have wasted in my life on this. I joke. See, I really don't like this angle for my neck. So we're just going to go to pipe script here. And it should start off with attach rate. I don't know, total lines change. Oh, wow, I'm about at 60,000 total lines changed for my bot. And about 
35,000 for me, which itself is actually kind of a crazy good sign of how much value PipeScript is bringing to PipeScript. Basically doubling my money here. And yeah, that's basically about 100,000 lines of code in a year. Now, I'm not saying net, that's just a very quick metric of, you know, how this has been going and how long, you know, how much work has been put in so far. Uh, it's about half of the commit history length of the PowerShell repo and growing fast. Because it's a really cool project and I'm having lots of fun. But let's also get a kind of sense over time. It's new, it's actually from this last summit. And, you know, you can see, didn't exist until June. And it's been a pretty steady, long year. Took the holidays off a bit, but yeah, I'm going to continue to grow this because I get so much bang for the buck out of this. Honestly, I'm sharing this all with you. I hope you use it. I hope you adopt it. I hope you break the game of PowerShell wide open and use PipeScript to do amazing things in the world. And if none of you did, I would not care that much because I get that much extra bang for the buck. I'm gonna just go to one other example module here for a second because we have a sense of the scale of it, but not of the scale that it generates. So I'm gonna go to PSSVG start-automating.com. Okay, this was built with PypeScript by actually going to MDN, ripping all of the documentation on every single SVG element in existence, using the new PypeScript command to generate a function for each of them, and using some inheritance to extend SVG to do more things than the standard can do. And that's just gonna be another bunch of pictures that speak a thousand words. But before I get to them, let's talk about the ratio here. 700 lines of pipe script. Take a guess. Do we hear 100,000 lines code, 100,000 lines code, 200,000 lines code, 200, no? Three million lines of code. 700 lines of pipe script. Three million lines of code. And look at what it can do. We'll get to the really fun one in a second. I sometimes call this one my Doctor Strange demo. Because it kind of would be right at home there, right? So with such a small amount of effort on top of this great technology, I was able to build a bridge to a whole ecosystem of the web and do crazy beautiful things. So this is one of the many amazing feats of the abstract syntax tree. I'm sure if you spend a few minutes on your own, you will be able to come up with some magic tricks too. Any questions? It's typed in the very powerful object by point out your bank. Again, sometimes I really don't love the answer. Right now, that's a function info. Okay? There are a variety of ways that I could write this. In this case, I'm doing a very uh, That is some of what this enables with, say, validate script block. That's not something I would necessarily endorse doing willy-nilly for performance reasons. Ideally, PypeScript's going to generate faster code than you would naturally write. Cool. Thank you.